Your Excellency, Miss Lina Annab, Ambassador of Jordan in Japan, Professor Nijal Abjaba, Professor of the German Jordanian University, distinguished faculty members, professionals, and students of GRITS, Chinese Sichuan University, German Jordan University, you inspire and other prominent institutes and organizations, and their colleagues. Good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to the joint online seminar on water and disasters, learning from history and culture. The seminar is co-organized by GRIPS and the Embassy of Japan in Tokyo. I sincerely thank High Excellency Ambassador Ms. Lina Anab for her cooperation and dedication in organizing this meaningful event. Water has been closely associated with human beings since ancient civilization periods. It has been intertwined with the people in critical fields for their existence, such as health, food, energy, disasters, and the environment. It underpins social and economic development of regions and enhanced welfare and happiness of the inhabitants if managed properly. At the same time, water has been a major source of care and concern as it may negatively impact people in the forms of drought and floods anytime, anywhere. Water has affected in many ways formulation of the culture and society. Learning the process of interaction between people and water will give us hints to build optimal relations between environment and humanity in the future. It will also help us explore better ways to adapt to climate and other global changes. In this connection, GRIPS have sponsored a series of global events to share experiences and lessons on water, disaster, and culture including International Symposium on Water Culture in February this year, which was kindly attended by their majesties, emperor and empress of Japan. Today, we are pleased to invite Professor Nijal Abjaba, professor of the German Jordanian University and head of the Center for the Study of Natural and Cultural Heritage. Professor Abjaba is a geologist working in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the German Jordanian University. He has almost three decades of experience in research and project development and management in the fields of geology, archaeometry, landscape studies, geochemistry, as well as surface and groundwater. In today's lecture, titled Flood Control and Water Management in Nabachi and Petra, Professor Abjaba will share with us a long-standing history of Jordanian people in managing and living with flood and water. I am very much excited to learn from his distinguished lecture and exchange views on this important subject, together with over 100 participants today. This online seminar is a part of a doctoral course program on international policies on water and disasters at GRIPS, but globally open to viewers who are interested in the subject. I particularly welcome professionals and students of Sichuan University of China. You inspire an alliance of alliances on water and disaster research which are internationally active under Professor Gretchen Kalonji, Dean of IDMR of Sichuan University. Questions and lively discussion by you all will make the event more meaningful and benefit stakeholders of your con countries through your deepened knowledge and understanding. I look forward to this fruitful discussion today. Thank you very much. Now, I ask Ambassador Lina Anna to give her welcome remarks. Ms. Anab, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Professor Hiroki, for uh, this introduction. Um, good morning and uh, good evening to all uh, from rainy Tokyo. Um, on behalf of all of us at the Embassy of Jordan in Japan, I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar. Allow me to start by expressing my deep gratitude to our dear friends at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, GRIPS. And in particular, I'd like to thank the president of GRIPS, Mr. Akihiko Tanaka, who has been extremely supportive in opening up potential channels of academic collaboration between Jordan and GRIPS. I would also like to thank our dear friend, Professor Kenzo Hiroki, whose role was pivotal in making this webinar happen. We were all so impressed by how engaged and personally hands-on he was, Professor Hiroki was, throughout the preparation for this webinar. Thank you, Professor Hiroki. 
I'm also grateful to our speaker and presenter today, Professor Abu Jaber, who was immediately ready and forthcoming in accommodating our request to hold this webinar and to share with us some of his research findings. It is great that we have students joining us today, not only from Japan, but also from Jordan, Jordan German, uh, German Jordanian University, and from China, China Sichuan University. And I also must uh, extend my gratitude to the Dean of Sichuan University, Professor Gretchen Kalonji, for joining us today, along with her students. We're deeply honored that you were able to, uh, to be with us today. Thank you. Having students with us uh, is a good opportunity to express to all of them how proud we feel of all the students uh, who are with us today and students all over the world. The academic faculties, the administrators, all of them who have, who due to COVID-19 must be facing major challenges and disruptions in their academic programs and who continue to show resilience and strong will to give and to learn. Hybrid and online learning have become the most repeated words in academic settings, driving anxiety driven, uh, uh, leading to anxiety driven by the uncertainty of the pandemic situation locally, regionally, and globally. To all of them, I send my best wishes and I encourage them to hang in there. We are all with you and we stand ready to help you in any which way possible. And as uh, it is said in Japan, Gambatte gudasai. Please, uh, I think it's a tough time that you are going through, but I know that uh, it will be soon over. And I think probably in terms of education, probably this is one of the most important lessons that we will all remember throughout uh, our lives. Today's webinar was inspired by the symposium that was just mentioned by Dr. Hiroki. It's an international symposium that I attended at GRIPS in February in 2020, this year, on the subject of water and culture. And it's called for learning from water heritage to innovate regional development. During the symposium, it was wonderful to hear president, the president of ECOMOS, Professor Toshiyoki Kono, speak of Petra as a timeless model for the highly sophisticated and extensive water distribution systems that enabled it to flourish and expand. Although it might be coincidental, but today's webinar happens to fulfill some of the recommendations made after the symposium, and in particular in its call for, first, initiating a multi-stakeholder dialogues jointly by, what, jointly by water professionals and heritage experts at local, national, and global levels to raise awareness, deepen mutual understanding, and inspire and strengthen the cultural values of water and commit tangible actions on the significance of water-related heritages for sustainable future. Another recommendation that came out of that symposium was making use of power of ICT, artificial intelligence, and big data to identify, assess, and visualize water cultural heritage for everybody. Probably we did not foresee that we will also will need to use this ICT in the communication in talking about water, because it was just at the very beginning of COVID, we had no idea that we will be faced with what we are facing to, uh, uh, with today now. As far as Petra is concerned, uh, Petra is probably one of the most famous archeological sites in the world. It has been inhabited since prehistoric times and the evidences are there. So this is what also makes it extremely interesting. Petra is on every traveler's bucket list. I have never met anybody who does not want to go to Petra. Uh, and even those who have been to Petra, they want to go back again. It is also repeatedly voted by independent surveys as one of the top places to visit in the world. In fact, just a few days ago, Petra was uh, uh, one of the top surveys done by the famous Lonely Planet guy, a travel guidebook voted Petra as the number one place to visit in the world for 2020 and 2021. Uh, you might, you know, 2020, we might write it off because, because of COVID, but we are hoping and looking forward to receiving guests uh, in Jordan and in Petra in particular in 2021. So it's wonderful to see that Petra is up there. 
this you might have seen on the news because it was reported on international media. For us Jordanians, Petra evokes a myriad of affective feelings from pride to fascination to love. Petra to us is the jewel in our, in our archeology span and heritage crown. And believe me, we have many, many beautiful precious stones in this crown. But still, Petra always happens to, take, to be, to, to be uh, the one taking the, um, the, top, the, the, the top vote for, for everyone. The Nabataean civilization dates back from the fourth century before common era to the first century uh, common era or, or uh, after Christ, as we say. Petra was the capital of the Nabataeans, as you know, which is situated in the southern part of Jordan. Petra is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was listed uh, on, this, uh, on the heritage site in 1985. It covers an area of about 260 square kilometers or the equivalent of 26,000 hectares. It is one of the world's richest and largest archeological site set in a dominating red sandstone uh, landscape. On so many fronts, Petra represents a masterpiece of human creative genius. Some of the manifestation of this ingenuity is the water management system, which allowed extensive settlement of an essentially arid area during the Nabataean, Roman and Byzantine periods. And this is today what we will be learning more about. The remnants of the diversion dams, the tunnels, the water channels, the aqueducts, the reservoirs and cisterns are an outstanding example of water engineering that the Nabataeans had. In today's lens, Petra represents a badly needed model for the use of sustainable applied technology in creating dynamic and harmonized inter interaction between human populations and the surrounding environment. As we get ready to listen to Professor Abu Jaber, it is worth mentioning that his research as complex as it is in using geology and archeology span to make sense of history and to learn from it it also calls for a simple but powerful proposition. It calls for the idea of why not revive the ancient technologies of the Nabataeans for use in today's agriculture and flood control in the area and in many other areas. I mean, this is something we always think about. If the Nabataeans were able to do it thousands of years ago. Why can't we do it today? Why don't we apply what was applied then today? Because we know it works. In the context of Jordan and in many parts of the world, as well as well, water harvesting as well as flood control measures are becoming of urgent need. Jordan's rank in annual precipitation is among the lowest 10 in the world. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, Jordan receives an annual of 111 millimeter in precipitation uh, a year, while the annual global average is 1,155. Just to give you, any, uh, to put things in perspective, Japan's annual average is about 1,668. Jordan gets 111. So you can imagine how, how, how desperately, how desperate we are in finding ways, in learning, in understanding how we can uh, manage this resource in our daily lives. Climate and global changes are placing tremendous stress on resources, natural, natural and otherwise. Access to clean and safe water remains a crucial and vital element for inclusive development. Even with the most basic requirement of washing hands due to the pandemic that we are experiencing, we are more than ever reminded of the importance of having safe access to clean and safe water. Water is, a vi is vital to ensure peace and inclusive development again. We have great role models to learn from, whether it is the great Dr. Tetsu Nakamura, who tragically passed away last year, or the Nabataeans who existed more than 3000 years ago the, import, the importance of water can never be understated. In short, learning from our ancestors is a great way to mitigate the risks we face and to adapt in a responsible and sustainable way to the environmental and global changes we are facing. Once again, thank you very much. And Professor uh, Abu Jaber, I can't wait to hear your presentation. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ambassador, uh, for your wonderful speech. That explains not only the uh, you know the background, but also details of how why Nabati and Petra is important for the people of Jordan. Uh, this is very interesting. And now my interest in uh, Navajo and Petra is increasing more and more because of your speech. And also, thank you very much for encouraging us to the students who are having difficulty under COVID-19. And this uh, seminar is one of the examples to show solidarity among the global people, Jordan, Japan, and China, and other countries. So we can unite to fight this COVID by listening to wonderful speech of uh, Professor Nijal. Before asking uh, Professor Nijal for his uh, distinguished lecture, uh, I have a few things to, to tell about uh, in terms of the housekeeping announcement. First of all, after the lecture, there'll be a queue and a corner. You know, we have the uh, over 100 uh, viewers, but you can ask questions by writing uh, your question in the a chat room of this Zoom. I will watch it out and uh, ask uh, you know, a few of you to ask questions. If there are uh, some similar questions, I'll ask one other representative, uh, but uh, also I may ask questions on behalf of the, you know, uh, those who may be questioned. And for those who are you know, listening from China, I, I have learned that uh, some uh, video difficulty exists in your university. Uh, so in that case, the secretariat has already received a presentation slide from uh, Professor Nija. So that presentation slide will be distributed to you uh, very soon, even while you are listening to the, to the speech. So having said that, I'm now I cannot wait to learn more from uh, Professor Nijab Jabbar. So after his profile, distinguished profile, you have already received the invitation letter in which that, uh, uh, you know, brilliant career is already described. So I do not have to you know, spend time, precious time for that. Now, I'd like to ask Professor Nijab Jabbar for, for the lecture. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much for all of these uh, kind words and introduction and for the invitation. Uh, I'm definitely uh, honored to be invited to, uh, to give this presentation. And I give this presentation in uh, my own name as well as in the name of all of my collaborators. Uh, one of the reasons the German Jordanian University was established was to start uh, a different uh, approach towards learning and towards research uh, because the German Jordanian University was established as an applied university with a hands-on uh, approach towards uh, research and learning, and with a view towards practical solutions rather than uh, simply doing academic research. And uh, with that in mind, it's important to uh, think about what we know and what we learn in a more applied uh, uh, context which is why the German Jordanian University actually uh, established the Center for the Study of Natural and Cultural Heritage in uh, 2011. And the idea of establishing the center was to uh, create uh, some sort of a nexus for uh, doing uh, multidisciplinary research and uh, providing prov uh, applied solutions towards the different uh, challenges that face both natural and cultural heritage in Jordan, which as uh, Her Excellency uh, has just uh, told us, is uh, quite uh, extensive in Jordan. We have a lot of jewels in our archeological and natural uh, heritage crown. 
and uh, these uh, uh, jewels need to be taken care of. It's very easy actually to take them for granted when you're in Jordan because there's so many of them and it's all around us. And so we kind of dismiss them in many uh, cases. And of course, uh, we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, but we're happy to, uh, to have established this center and we've received uh, a lot of recognition and awards, including the Ikram uh, Sharjah Award, which we've been shortlisted for this year. And uh, I think uh, we have a very good opportunity to win. So uh, let's uh, hope that happens. And uh, you can always uh, check us up on our website and see what we're up to. Uh, it's provided here. So uh, we're talking about Petra, and we're talking specifically about the issue of flooding as well as water management. Uh, most of the research I'm going to discuss here is concerning flooding. And it's important to uh, think of flooding uh, as both a blessing and as a curse because for two reasons. One is because flooding provides water, and so it provides an opportunity to harvest water in this arid environment. But also the reason why we have Petra in the first place is because we have the action of water. Uh, that's why you have the physiography that's there, uh, in addition to the uh, issue of tectonics. So tectonics, climate, and water uh, interact with each other to produce the setting that was needed to, to have Petra in the first place. So looking at it from a, a tectonic uh, point of view, uh, we know that uh, jo uh, Jordan uh, lies on this uh, Dead Sea uh, Transform Fault, which is an extension of the Red Sea Transform Fault, which is also extending into East Africa. So this all this plate tectonic boundary uh, is, uh, is one of the more famous ones around the world. And of course, uh, Petra is lying right on the uh, uh, eastern boundary of the uh, Dead Sea Transform Fault in southern Jordan. And of course, when you do have a transform fault, it manifests itself as a series of faults, actually, that uh, create this very distinct physiography, which is sim very similar to what we have in, uh, in Jordan. So if we look at uh, this uh, uh, on Google Earth, and we take the correct angle, we see that uh, Jordan actually is uh, basically a plateau that has uh, cut at its eastern boundary by this uh, Dead Sea uh, Wadi Araba uh, Valley, which is, of course, uh, part of the Dead Sea Transform System. And uh, you can see uh, this uh, gives us a lot of insight into what's happening in terms of water, actually, because this highland up here and extends to the south is actually uh, where we get most of our rainwater. Uh, but what happens is some of it runs off into these uh, valleys and ends up either in the Dead Sea or in uh, playas uh, in Wadi Araba. Uh, but uh, a lot of it also soaks up into the ground and comes out in terms of springs along this uh, Rift Valley. So if we look at the older cities of Jordan, uh, including Petra, we see that they're, all of them tend to fall on this uh, rift somewhere because water uh, falls onto these highlands, goes into the uh, soil, recharges the aquifers, and comes out at springs. So we have all of these springs that uh, are on this rift, and that's where we have Amman, and we have Salt, and we have Fatila, and we have Wadi Musa, which is where Petra is, uh, because of this uh, setting. So basically, these are agricultural lands up here, but the uh, old urban centers of Amman, are, are of Jordan, I mean, are along this uh, rift. And of course, uh, Petra uh, lies uh, over here. and. Uh, if you look at the ge geological map, you might think, OK, what's this? Uh, pretty colors. Uh, but uh, what does it mean in terms of uh, uh, what we see uh, on the ground? So what we have, actually, is the highlands. Uh, we have exposed this uh, uh, upper Cretaceous limestone. And these are uh, the upper parts 
of the rift margin where water, uh, some of it soaks up into the ground here and some of it goes down into valleys, down into the uh, lower parts. The lower parts includes this uh, white uh, sandstone, which, which is our division, uh, what we call the DC sandstone. And this DC sandstone uh, forms uh, important outcrops both in uh, northern and in southern part of Petra, but mostly in northern Petra, uh, which is and uh, towards the rift. And if you go deeper, then uh, you get the classic Um uh, red sandstone, which is where most of the uh, uh, ancient city of Petra was carved into. So this is a Cambrian uh, continent and uh, quartz arenite, if any of you is a geologist. So um, uh, we have the physiography, we have the geology. We, uh, of course, there's a lot of details to the geology because of the faulting and because of the different uh, phases that happened before and during and after the faulting. But uh, there's no need to go into that now. Uh, we have a lot of variation in terms of rainfall. This is from the Wadi Musa climatological station, uh, which shows us uh, this uh, huge uh, swing in amount of rainfall from year to year. So we have this um, um, erratic, let's say, pattern of rainfall that uh, happens from year to year, as you can see. But you can also see uh, that uh, uh, what we have is a lot of uh, spatial variability in rainfall as well. So this is an example of one of the storms that happened in Jordan. Uh, and it shows, uh, this is a radar uh, picture. And uh, most of the flooding that we see happens because of what we call these convective uh, storms. And the nature of convective storms is that they're um, patchy in terms of their spatial distribution. And so uh, how that manifests itself uh, in reality is that if you're standing somewhere, it might be raining and you might move away a couple of kilometers and you don't have rain or you have different amounts of rains, even within a small area. And uh, this means, of course, that if you have one rainfall station, uh, it may or may not be representative of how much uh, rainfall you're getting. And so uh, if you go back and look at uh, this, you have to remember that this is one station and you might have a different pattern if you have uh, more stations distributed uh, along the area. So this is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about uh, the pattern of uh, rainfall and uh, how that's going to translate later into flooding events, uh, which uh, of course is dependent not only about on the annual amount of rainfall, but on the intensity of rainfall, which is another limitation to the uh, rainfall records we have, because the rainfall records that we have uh, don't go back very far, and they don't give us the hourly, uh, or we have at best daily records. And Many of these rainfall events actually are very intense. They happen over short periods of time. And in order to properly understand the, uh, the runoff, we need to properly understand the rain. And the rain is, uh, again, you have the spatial distribution, you have the uh, annual uh, patchiness. And you have this issue, uh, which is that you can get a lot of rainfall within a very short period of time. So if you get uh, 10 millimeters of uh, rain over 24 hours, it's very different than getting 10 millimeters of rain in uh, 15 minutes, which is also something that can happen. And so understanding this variability is also uh, key to understanding what's going on. Uh, uh, everybody knows this uh, facade of the treasury at Petra. This is one of the iconic uh, uh, images in Jordan. And it's uh, interesting to note that uh, in, in 2000, 2001, uh, this uh, area uh, was uh, excavated for archaeology. And we find a second facade uh, underneath the upper facade. And uh, the implication of, of this, of course, is that this area was all buried because of flooding. 
And it's been estimated that this five meters of sediment that formed this uh, platform in front of the treasury uh, all was deposited in about at least uh, 15 events within a period of 40 years. So within 40 years, you had all of this deposition that happened that uh, covered up the lower uh, uh, part of the uh, treasury facade. And so it just tells you uh, about how much flooding and how much sediment you can get uh, uh, in this area. And it's important also to note that, okay, so you had five meters of sediment in 40 years, 2000 years ago, uh, and since uh, 2000 years ago have passed, uh, this platform seems to have been pretty much stable. So there was no sediments after that, which uh, imp implies that there was some sort of intervention that uh, stopped the flooding, or at least mitigated the flooding and mit mitigated the uh, deposition of all of these uh, sediments that used to come in here. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, Nabataeans, uh, as uh, Her Excellency uh, pointed out, are uh, very well known for their ability to manage uh, water. And this management system includes dams, cisterns, canals, uh, pipes, uh, spread all around Petra. Of course, there's a number of springs uh, along the margin that I mentioned. The springs are not in Petra, they're uh, in the upper reaches of Petra in places like Wadi Musa and along that elevation. And so the water uh, generally was brought into Petra through canals or pipes. Um, so, and of course, as I noted, there's an extensive system of those as I show you a map of it in a few minutes. And uh, of course, uh, the issue of water management is extensively studied. Uh, but what hasn't been studied very well in the past is the problem of uh, flooding itself. Um, and so uh, just to keep a, a scope of uh, what we're talking about in terms of uh, amounts, uh, we have a drainage area that's about 50 square kilometers. The long-term average of rainfall in the area is about uh, 180 millimeters a year. And so if you just multiply 180 millimeters a year times 50 square kilometers, that gives you about 9 million cubic meters of water that are falling over this drainage basin. And uh, individual floods of 4 to 5 million cubic meters, just one single event, uh, have been documented. So again, this talk tells us more about this issue of variability that I keep uh, mentioning. So you're talking about uh, 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 huge amounts of water that come in in terms of both uh, recharge of the aquifers and in terms of individual floods that go through the uh, valleys uh, and tributaries that are there that I'll mention in a few minutes as well. Uh, of course, when you look at the dams that are there, like this one at uh, Wadi Farasa, uh, or this one that are uh, that's in the upper uh, catchment at Prague. Um, these are dams that can contain at most about 2,000 cubic uh, meters uh, of water. So when you're talking about 2,000 and you have a bunch of cisterns and all of that and these little dams, uh, you might add up to 20,000. Uh, and this is just an educated guess, about 20,000 cubic uh, meters at most of storage capacity for all of these systems. So when you're talking about an individual flood that can be four or five million uh, cubic meters, then uh, you can understand that the scale of uh, water management had to be mostly uh, uh, managed not through simply diverting water into these dams, which are obviously not big enough, but uh, also uh, thinking of ways to, uh, to mitigate the issue of flooding that, uh, uh, that comes through every uh, year or two. Uh, so this is uh, an old map of all of the cisterns and dams that are uh, in the area of Petra. And you, as I said, okay, these are important in terms of water uh, 
management and providing what uh, the inhabitants of the site needed at the time. So there was plenty of water for their needs. And then you had all of this extra water that was coming in terms of flooding. And if you uh, kind of plot uh, on, on this uh, image uh, uh, from Google Earth again of the different uh, flood management systems, you can see that they're distributed all along the eastern mar margin of the rift. Again, Petra is in this low area here, it's about, so uh, just in terms of scale, in terms of elevation differences, you're talking about a difference of uh, six kilometers uh, along this length between the highlands and uh, the center of Petra about that. And then you have uh, the elevation here is about uh, 800, uh, uh, 750 to 800 meters above sea level, and here it's about 1,100 uh, meters uh, above sea level. So within six kilometers, you have about 400 meters difference in elevation. And so you can imagine uh, how uh, quickly the water will flow through those valleys simply because of uh, uh, the very high gradient uh, that we have in terms of the uh, uh, of the valleys that are here. And so you notice that all of these water management systems are kind of towards the upper parts of the drainage system. So if you go to the lower part, I don't have any of those arrows, uh, even though there are a few small terrace systems, uh, especially at Turkmenia and so forth. But uh, generally speaking, uh, the most uh, significant uh, interventions that were made to prevent the flooding were in the upper reaches. And here I'm going to focus on Wadi uh, Lehremi a little bit, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the small tributaries that uh, it's small, but it's important. And the reason for its importance is that it floods directly into the uh, plaza of the treasury. So uh, I, I showed an, a picture earlier of, uh, of a flood at, uh, at the treasury. And the water from that flood actually was coming from this valley. So uh, this is an important, uh, even though it's a small tributary, as I said, it's important because uh, a lot of the headaches that Dr. Sleiman and the other PDTRA uh, uh, officials uh, have to deal with is the flooding that comes uh, from, this, uh, uh, from this small tributary. So uh, when we think about uh, runoff uh, from a quantitative point of view, we have to think about, uh, again, the nature of the rainfall, where does it fall, how much did it fall, how quickly did it fall, all of these issues uh, we need to know. We need to know where we are within the drainage basin to think about uh, what can be done in terms of uh, uh, management of these uh, uh, floods. We have to think about the slope. We have to think about the nature of the soil and the rock cover, uh, whether it uh, um, it actually has uh, an ability to soak up the water or doesn't soak up the water. So we have to think about the permeability. All of these issues, if we want to quantitatively understand uh, what's happening uh, at a specific uh, drainage basin, we kind of need to think about all of these uh, parameters. Um, of course, uh, we, uh, we have to ask where water goes, some of it evaporates, some of it infiltrates, as I noted, and of course, what we're dealing with is what ends up as runoff, so uh, we need to kind of uh, differentiate the different segments of the hydrological cycle uh, in order to be able to kind of, again, quantitatively think about management within these drainage basins. Um, so this is a, a map uh, derived from the digital elevation model of Petra. And uh, the most important uh, drainage system actually is the Wadi Musa drainage system, which uh, kind of flows down, goes into the Sikh and comes out at Wadi Siyakh. And so uh, many of the more dramatic uh, videos we see about flooding actually comes from the integration of water coming from different sources uh, in this upper part of the area of Wadi Musa, and then goes down into this lower area into the Sikh and then out. 
uh, we have one of these uh, side wadis at Hremiya. Uh, Wadi al Hremiya is uh, relatively small if you add up all of these uh, uh, sub basin areas. So this is about half square kilometers, 0.07 square kilometers, 0.11. So all of it adds up to about uh, maybe a couple of uh, square kilometers, which is a uh, focus of a uh, a lot of what we're doing now. So if you want to take one of these small sub basins and uh, consider what happens in it and uh, how, uh, how flooding occurs, um, uh, this is uh, again uh, the Hremiya area um, magnified. This is where we are in Jordan, of course. Um, and this uh, is uh, uh, a map of the water flow. This is uh, the Wadi Musa area. Uh, what happened in uh, the Wadi Musa flooding is actually it comes through the sea, which doesn't show on this picture. Uh, what the Nabataeans did, one of their flood interventions was they cut off the water that goes into the sea uh, by building a dam and then constructing a tunnel that goes around this mountain that's here that's called Jebel Kupta. And then it comes out around here. So that's one of the flood interventions. So not all of what they did was uh, terracing and flood management of the headwaters, especially for Wadi Musa, because uh, the scale of the problem was too, be, too big to be dealt with uh, simply by terracing in the upper regions, even though they did some of that too. And then you have other uh, tributaries to the south, uh, which form uh, less of a problem, uh, let's say, for, for the management of the site. So this is basically the biggest headache for the site is this. Um, so, uh, the Nabataeans built, did build uh, an extensive terrace system to collect the water. And of course, uh, uh, just thinking of it in a rational way, uh, you couldn't again um, store all of that water in the available cisterns and dams that existed because simply they weren't big enough. So the only way to, uh, to control this or to mitigate it, let's say, was to uh, uh, encourage uh, the, uh, the water to be infiltrated into the soils. So basically, uh, the most important approach to flood management was to uh, encourage uh, soil infiltration uh, rather than uh, storage in, in open reservoirs. Uh, and uh, when you consider the amount of soil that you have and uh, rocks and aquifers, uh, it becomes clear quantitatively that uh, you have much more uh, capacity to store, wa store water and soil than you do to store it within dams or in cisterns. So, uh, and people tend not to think about soil water as being stored water. But in fact, it is stored water. Any water that's in the soil that the plants can use, that you can use for agriculture or for forestry or for anything else, is useful water. So uh, the idea that, OK, you lost the water in the soil is not uh, particularly accurate. Uh, encouraging water to infiltrate into the, so the soil does provide uh, agricultural uh, opportunities as well as the ability to uh, to mitigate the flooding problem, as I keep uh, saying. So uh, the increasing the infiltration was generally done through uh, uh, encouraging infiltration within uh, these terrace systems. So what are terrace systems? Basically, uh, terrace systems are uh, artificially constructed walls. Um, and you might uh, wonder about the soil, whether this soil is fill actually, or is it pre-existing soil that people have uh, built these walls on? And of course, depending on uh, where you're looking, uh, you have both cases. Some cases you have people uh, who have built the terraces to uh, just stabilize the slope and do, you know make a flat surface, and that will encourage uh, infiltration and discourage runoff. Uh, we have these stone wedges which uh, stabilize the soil and prevent the swelling of clays uh, affecting the stability of the wall. So we have a lot of tricks that have been done to, uh, uh, to uh, increase the longevity of these, uh, these structures. Uh, 
Uh, so you have uh, uh, different shapes and forms, actually, of these terraces. You don't have one type of terrace. You have a number of terraces that uh, perform multiple functions. And so these include uh, collection of soil and uh, silt, uh, again, uh, slowing down the flow of water and creating these level surfaces that can be actually plowed and planted. So uh, there are multiple functions. And if you look actually at the functions of these dams, you can see that they uh, include uh, water collection and uh, soil uh, protection and enhancement. So there's different typologies that perform different types of functions. And if you look again at our small catchment at Wadi Hremiya, you see that this is the, how these uh, terraces and uh, gabions and check dams uh, are distributed. And if you look at them, you'll see that they actually are not all the same. Uh, so uh, if you look at the upper parts of the catchment, you uh, find these gabions. And these gabions, as you see, uh, are uh, different uh, thicknesses. Uh, from top to bottom. And they're designed, of course, to uh, hold back the sediment to, uh, to prevent the collapse. Because again, uh, one of the problems of flooding isn't just water, it's the debris. And so uh, the issue of soil protection is not only an issue of agriculture, but it's also an issue of protection of the site. Because uh, if you have all those canals and you have all those uh, facades and all of these things in the bottom, you don't want them to be buried in sediments. So uh, the issue of sediment control is uh, just as important, if not more important, than the actually control of water, which, OK, I mean, water is a menace during the flood. But uh, the deposition of sediments is a much more uh, long-term problem uh, if that becomes an issue. Uh, so you have gabions in the upper parts of the catchment. Uh, in the middle part of the catchment, you have this type of design called the uh, Valerani types of uh, terrace structures. And the idea here is not simply to hold the sediment, but actually uh, to uh, channel the water in a sideway manner. And that will lengthen uh, the flow uh, the flow of the water. So the, instead of the water just going up and down, it's kind of being sloshed from side to side. And the idea, of course, is to lengthen the water path to increase the soil infiltration. And of course, to uh, decrease the gradient, because of course, the water is going sideways uh, with this design. It's not only going uh, from top to bottom. So uh, we have uh, this type of system in the middle type part of the uh, slope. And then if you go to the bottom part of the slope, you see these very uh, uh, distinct uh, check downs. And these were the last line of defense for flooding. The, the more important ones actually are the ones that are in the upper parts of the catchment. But uh, we do have a series of these dams at the bottom too. Uh, we have one here, we have one here, we have one here, if you notice. And these, of course, are designed to, again, uh, more slow the flow of water than to actually uh, collect the water. So it's kind of a more uh, tempering uh, effect rather than a collection of water. So um, what did we do? Well, uh, in order to understand this whole system, so we can see it, we can uh, measure it in terms of what's there. And I'll go through that uh, in a few minutes. But what's, uh, what we need to do is understand uh, the system from a hydrological point of view, because it's all well and good to say, OK, we have, uh, uh, we have all of these systems, and this slows down the water, and this increases infiltration. And all of this is very qualitative. And what we wanted to do is to be more quantitative in our approach. So we want to know exactly uh, what is the terrain? What is the slope? Uh, we need to have, how do these terraces fall on the slope? Where, where are they? Uh, how do they change from location to location? We need to quantify the runoff infiltration relationship. How much is runoff and how much is infiltration under different types of conditions, under different types of soil? We need to quantify that. We also need to uh, understand these. Uh, of course, I gave you some of the functions and how they're uh, designed, but that was also 
part of what we've uh, done as a team here. Uh, then uh, what we want to do is to uh, create these computer models that will simulate what happens. So of course, any computer, anybody who knows anything about computers knows the term uh, GIGO, uh, garbage in, garbage out. And so if you want to do a computer model, you want good data. And you want good data, you want good understanding of terrain, you want good understanding of the rainfall, you need, one, uh, you need good understanding of the infiltration, um, uh, you need a good understanding of the runoff because, uh, okay, you save flooding and four or five uh, million cubic meters. Uh, the, these aren't, uh, uh, these are, of course, on Wadi Musa when we say four or five million cubic, uh, cubic uh, meters. But what, what about Wadi Hiramiya, these smaller tributaries? Uh, how much water flows in them? How quickly does it flow? Uh, so we need to have hydrographs. We need to monitor the, the runoff as well. So none of this data was actually available before we started. And so in order to uh, have a very good understanding of what's happening from a hydrological perspective, uh, we needed to go in and uh, have a better understanding of all of these different types of uh, components of the model. Before we could actually do any computer modeling, we needed to have real data because prior to what we've done, we didn't have uh, the quality of data that we needed to have a, a very good understanding. Uh, so we start with the idea of uh, understanding the site. Of course, we have a digital elevation model. Digital elevation models uh, are much coarser in terms of their resolution than what we needed. So we uh, had to do on the ground surveying using drones and the real time kinematic uh, surveying. And uh, this will uh, allow uh, a better modeling of how water would throw, flow through this, uh, this basin. Uh, so uh, we did this uh, uh, scanning of the site. This is our uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Abdullah Rawabda, um, with his drone. Uh, so uh, we did a very good scanning of the site using this, uh, also using uh, this uh, real-time uh, kinematic. And this allowed us actually to create a very high resolution uh, map of the drainage basin. Uh, which I'll show you some of uh, some of it here. So these triangles are actually data points, and this is all uh, after we did a 3D scanning of the site. We were able to actually uh, these aren't photographs; these are uh, 3D scanning of the area. And so you can go up and down the drainage basin, and you can see individual plants, individual rocks. Uh, of course, uh, more importantly than any of these specific um, uh, objects that you can see, you can actually measure distances. So you, we have a very, very high quality uh, a database for where the terraces are, as you can see here, plus their heights, plus their thicknesses, plus the slopes, plus where the soil is, plus where the rocks is, are. All of these things uh, uh, are now available in, uh, uh, in uh, not just uh, as photographs, but we can actually give exact coordinates and elevations for every single point within, uh, within this drainage basin. So we're going up the drainage basin now from the lower part to the higher part. So we have this uh, very high quality uh, data. And uh, yeah. So, so you can imagine uh, thinking about this in terms of modeling, how does the water flow uh, over these rocks and so forth. So uh, yeah, uh, we have uh, all of this information now. Um, I think we're showing off a little bit too much here. So let me go to the next slide. Um, so this allowed us to uh, uh, create uh, very high, again, resolution uh, maps of both the terrain and the distribution of these uh, terraces, uh, uh, as well as the different types of terraces. So we know the typologies, we know the locations, uh, we know the terrain, we know uh, pretty much everything there is to, uh, to know now. Uh, we needed to understand how do these different surfaces 
uh, respond to different types of rainfall events. So we actually took a, a rainfall simulator to the site and uh, did a number of experiments. And uh, experiments were not just at Wadi al but we actually uh, did in different locations around Petra in uh, the area of uh, north of uh, Umsaihun here, as well as uh, Vega over here, plus Ahremiya over here. So we have different locations where we can say we know how the rain ro runoff um, uh, characteristics change, both in terms of uh, um, uh, intensity and uh, quality. So um, we were trailing these torrents, trying to find out where they are uh, using uh, this device called the rainfall simulator. And uh, just uh, for anybody who's curious about what this uh, rainfall simulator does, it actually sprays water at the sprinkler. And basically you sprinkle the water on the ground and then you collect the water uh, that runs off and uh, you can, uh, what happens, of course, is when you first start to sprinkle, the water is all absorbed. But at some point, you start to generate runoff. And then when you start to generate runoff, you can, um, you can see how much runoff you, you have compared to how much water you're putting in. So you know how much water you're uh, uh, putting through the sprinkler. You're uh, measuring the infiltration of the soil at the initial stage and you're measuring the amount of runoff after you start to generate runoff, and then you reach some sort of equilibrium. So you never reach a point actually where the total amount of uh, water that's running off is exactly the same as the water you're putting in. You're always having infiltration. So uh, this, uh, this system actually gives us a very good uh, insight into, into how much uh, uh, rain runoff uh, relationships uh, have. So we took this to Petra and we, uh, uh, again, I explained how this works. And so uh, this is uh, us doing this uh, work uh, near Wed uh, on the upper uh, slopes. Um, this is the site we, uh, we investigated uh, uh, in uh, north of uh, Umsaihuan. And uh, again, um, uh, of course, it's related a lot to the texture of the soil. So uh, we have uh, different types of soils. It turns out that if you look at uh, the different parts of the, uh, the escarpment, uh, you have, uh, and uh, uh, whether it's terraced or not, you see that the terracing actually changes the components. So you have more silt and uh, clay uh, in terraced uh, areas than in unterraced areas. And so uh, this, uh, of course, uh, when you have silt and sand, that encourages infiltration. And so uh, when you have a terraced surface, what happens is uh, basically you start putting in, then you start to generate uh, runoff after, uh, so this is in liters per meter, you start putting in two liters per minute. And uh, so uh, initially you don't have any runoff after about uh, 14 minutes, you start reaching an equilibrium of 1.4 uh, liters per minute, which means of course that you're still infiltrating about 0.6 liters. So uh, this is useful information to understand how terraces work. If you look at unterraced uh, surfaces, what you have is of course uh, uh, it's, uh, different uh, so, um, yeah, uh, terracing actually encourages uh, infiltration. Um, then we uh, need to understand rain and we need to understand uh, runoff. And so uh, to understand the rain, we set up a number of uh, rainfall uh, collection devices uh, all along the drainage basin. So we actually have a number of stations that are uh, um, uh, collecting information on rainfall so we can have a better understanding of the, the, how sporadic the distribution of rainfall is in a spatial level. And of course, we need to understand runoff because if we don't understand runoff, then none of what we uh, uh, measured beforehand can be calibrated or understood very well. So uh, we installed a number of these uh, 
uh, rainfall uh, gauging devices all around uh, the area. These are tipping buckets. Uh, these are commercially available and we bought them and we installed them. Uh, we couldn't find uh, commercially available runoff devices, so we had to uh, build our own. Uh, one of the problems with uh, runoff in Jordan, generally speaking, is the fact that uh, you need to monitor uh, runoff at different places along drainage basins to understand exactly what's happening. We don't have many of those in Jordan. And when we do have them, uh, they're on the main uh, tributaries of the wadis. And the reason, of, of course, is because they're expensive, first of all, and secondly, because they're subject to vandalism. And so we, uh, we thought we we're going to devise these uh, runoff uh, devices that will measure exactly how much uh, runoff we're getting. Um, actually, this uh, measures the level of water and the uh, electronics here are uh, processing this data. And then we have uh, antennas and the uh, antennas actually are sending the data right to our labs at the German Jordanian University. So we actually are collecting real-time data of runoff whenever runoff events occur. Um, so uh, uh, one of the advantages of this system uh, is that it's, uh, it's kind of uh, cheap, relatively speaking. And so uh, when they get vandalized, which uh, once in a while this happens, uh, recently these uh, exact ones were vandalized, but it's okay because we can rebuild them and uh, reinstall them. Uh, and it doesn't cost very much. The only thing we lose uh, essentially is the data during the time that they're not uh, deployed. So well, we have runoff. So we have all the elements we need in terms of the hydrological cycle to uh, actually put together uh, uh, models for the rainfall. So we use uh, Dr. Qasim Abdel Al, who's actually uh, doing the hydrological modeling for us. And he's the one who oversaw the development of these runoff devices as well. Uh, so uh, you, we have now enough information to put together to create uh, real models uh, using uh, this uh, HEC uh, HMS software, which actually uh, is useful for uh, understanding uh, amount of runoff, the, the length of the runoff events in terms of time, and uh, how, you know, how quickly the water passes through. And uh, in addition to that, if we set up or rebuild these terraces, what would happen? Because uh, the fundamental question we always want to get back to is what, how will this uh, information be useful? And so what we're doing is actually saying, okay, now we have all of this data. What will happen if we rebuild the terrace system? Well, quantitatively, uh, how will it mitigate the flooding events uh, uh, at a real level? So in order to uh, do that, we had to bring a whole bunch of stakeholders on board uh, to, uh, to think about rebuilding this uh, terrace system. And so we got together on uh, March 19th last year, and uh, we got all the stakeholders, including the funding agency, the UNESCO, the ICOMOS, local NGOs like the Petro National Trust, ICOMOS, the governing authorities uh, for the site, which include the PDTRA, plus the Department of Antiquities of Jordan, plus people from the local community. We all that got together and kind of thought about the different options we have in terms of rebuilding these terraces to see exactly uh, how well they would work under uh, 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 under monitoring uh, modern monitoring conditions let's say uh, so uh, we uh, we thought okay we have this uh, uh, need to rehabilitate the site so we uh, this is uh, us uh, kind of setting things up we have a little crane there and uh, we said, okay, what are the choices that we have? We have uh, different uh, options in terms of design. One of the issues uh, we have to deal with uh, when we're dealing with Petra is, as uh, was mentioned previously, uh, PD, uh, Petra is a World Heritage Site, which means that uh, we can't do exactly whatever we want. We can't get a concrete mixer and start building dams there. That's not... Uh, 
uh, an acceptable uh, intervention. And so the, the building uh, or rebuilding or rehabilitation of these terraces actually uh, has uh, a number of ethical uh, and uh, uh, let's say aesthetic uh, implications that uh, need to be considered. So you can rebuild these terraces in different types of ways with different types of materials. Uh, one of the ethical issues is that, uh, generally speaking, modern interventions have to look like modern interventions. Uh, because if you build uh, something that looks old, it's kind of deceiving for anybody who's looking at the site. So we said, OK, Yanni, uh, how can we rebuild these terraces in a way that's uh, acceptable uh, from uh, from the perspective of uh, UNESCO, which uh, wants to maintain the integrity of Petra in terms of a World Heritage Site, which means the nature of the interventions that we do there have to be um, acceptable uh, from uh, uh, from the perspective of the different uh, uh, conventions that have been adopted to manage uh, World Heritage Sites. So, so we had that. So we said, okay, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. We decided uh, what are the different uh, options and what we would like to do. And then uh, based on that, we started working on the rehabilitation of the site. And this is our architect, uh, Safa Jude. Uh, uh, and uh, these are uh, some of the workmen working on the lower uh, check downs uh, in the area. We we started to do that. Um, so here's some of uh, uh, the local community. One of the aspects uh, that are important to note here is that we involve the local community in the rebuilding. So all of these are local workers uh, who are not only uh, uh, benefiting from the fact that they're getting a job, but they're also learning uh, how to do this type of work. Uh, uh, in an acceptable way. So it's uh, it's uh, uh, an employment uh, opportunity, but it's also a training opportunity. So involving the local community uh, actually is uh, quite important uh, to everybody involved because uh, we want to uh, be able to finish this project and say we left the skills and the knowledge needed to actually be able to uh, continue this work and also to uh, rehabilitate these uh, 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 these systems um, without uh, too much uh, outside supervision. So uh, so we have that. Um, yeah, we rebuilt these uh, with various levels of success. Let me say, and uh, anybody who wants to uh, follow up what we're doing in Petra can uh, follow our. Uh, ResearchGate project page for uh, Geoarchaeology of Petra. We have a whole bunch of uh, things we're doing down there. So this is one of them. And uh, yeah, you're all welcome to join and uh, if you're interested. And we're going to be keep uh, updating this uh, for a long time to come, I think. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Nijal, for this extremely interesting uh, lecture. I'm quite thrilled to learn uh, the you know, techniques and knowledges of the ancient Jordanian people who are really genius. I want to start the uh, question and answer section, but before that, we have an important guest here. Uh, here from Jordan, we have a participation from Mr. Suleiman Farajat. He is the Chief uh, Commissioner of the Petra Development and Tourism Region Authority. He is a very high person. So uh, if Mr. Farajat, if uh, you can listen yes. and speak. Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for uh, this opportunity again. Uh, and thank you for Dr. Nizar uh, for the presentation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I couldn't uh, I join the presentation from the beginning, but I am very much familiar with uh, this project and its outcome. Uh, in general, I would like to highlight that uh, the region of Petra as a World Heritage Site has uh, I mean, a very uh, fragile situation, especially in terms of flash uh, floods. And there have been over decades so many uh, studies. However, in the last two years, 
there have been more specific studies. One of them actually was coordinated with the UNESCO office in, uh, in Amman, which is a co comprehensive uh, plan to look at uh, water uh, flash floods in the region as a whole beyond Petra as an archeological uh, uh, bark. And we are now in the phase of looking for partners to develop some of the uh, strategies suggested in this uh, document. As where the project that uh, Dr. Uh, Mizar uh, and he discussed, uh, as the BDTRA, we have worked closely with the department with Jordanian uh, universities. Uh, in order to uh, uh, يعني, work in a micro level in such projects. This project has been now in Petra for almost uh, three years. And the good thing we are revising some of the techniques uh, used. And uh, we use it also as an opportunity to employ uh, local uh, staff from the side of the BDTRA. We very much uh, يعني, appreciate this involvement and we very much Support and also our uh, uh, partners from Japan, from all over, to be involved in this project uh, in the future. Besides the uh, outcome of this project that we are also expecting, the, proce the process itself for us, it's an experience. It's something we learn from. It's also a learn process for our uh, staff at the uh, BDTRA. And you know that Petra is not only important in a local or national level, it's a world heritage site, it's important for all humanity and we are open for any intervention. And in this occasion, I also would like to thank the efforts Her uh, Excellency Ambassador Anab is doing uh, to uh, yani position uh, Petra as uh, not only as a tourism destination for the Japanese uh, people, but also in terms of uh, um, uh, supporting research, not only in the field of heritage and tourism, but also other fields. And we very much highly appreciate that. And we will continue working with uh, Dr. Nizar and other organizations in the near future in order to protect Petra for the future uh, generation. And I want again to thank you all parties for facilitating and uh, making this happen. And you are welcome to visit us in Petra at any time, hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Farajat. This is a, exam, a great example of the collaboration between academia and the government in trying to preserve the uh, uh, heritage that is an asset not only for Jordan, but also for the, for the world. Indeed. And I'm really uh, glad that you know the Dutch, Japanese, and other partners are working together to raise profile of the water and culture in the organization of e-commerce. Probably we can convince them to include Jordanian initiatives to highlight the importance of water water related culture in the entire e-commerce organization. We would be happy. You are welcome. Thank you for this. Thank you very much for wonderful intervention at the beginning. Now I will enter into the question and answer, question and answer and the discussion section. Uh, before asking everybody to ask questions, which might be hundreds, uh, I would like to ask the uh, Professor Gretchen Kalonji, the Dean of the I, uh, IDMR of the Suichia University. Uh, Gretchen, sir, you are still in quarantine from the trip to Tokyo to Chengdu. Thank you yeah, for joining us. Three. Day three of 28. <laughs> but anyway, first of all, let, let me just uh, say how tremendously exciting your uh, talk was, uh, Professor Abu Jabbar. I mean, uh, I, I, wonderful honor for our, our faculty and students at IDMR to uh, benefit from your uh, experience. And I also would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Anab for her very kind remarks. But Basically, I have more of a comment than a question. What's really, really striking and exciting to me is the degree of commonality 
that we have between our, your, your region and your university and your World Heritage Site and our region and our university and our World Heritage Site. Okay, you know, but, <laughs> <laughs> as, 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 as many of you know, uh, Du Jiang Yan is uh, this, one of the you know, hallmarks of flood control and uh, irrigation system and created incidentally at the same time period as the Nabate in Jordan, you know, 2,300 years ago still in action. So uh, the other thing that we have in common in terms of the modalities of research and education between your center and your university and our institute and our university mm -hmm. is a commitment to multidisciplinary team-based research, a commitment to international partnership, and a commitment to getting the research into action, yeah. doing things that really have a result. So very briefly, I would, I would love to explore the possibility of some concrete projects that we could develop together between your center and our institute, focusing on very broad, broadly on the issues of uh, flood control and water management and the relationship with uh, both natural and cultural heritage, because we have uh, so much in common in those areas. So I, if, if you would be interested, I would love to would uh, follow up. That would be great. A very brief question, though. The other thing we, the regions have in common is they're highly seismically active. Yeah. So mm -hmm. can you give us a little bit of a insight about how uh, the seismic history played into uh, the Petra in general or, or any other aspects of the uh, well, hydrological? The tectonism is a very important uh, issue. Uh, uh, that's uh, definite. Uh, basically, the whole uh, region uh, actually is uh, is now being uh, eroded away. The, especially the more recent Pleistocene sediments are being er uh, eroded away because of tectonic uh, movements in the last fifteen or ten thousand years. So, uh, and yeah, and you understand uh, geologically speaking, you're talking about a very short period of time. So, uh, so the area actually is, uh, is highly dynamic because of this tectonic nature of it. And that's uh, part of the challenge is you're saying, okay, we have this area, it's uh, beautiful. It's also in the middle of a trading route and mm -hmm. it's also uh, arid and it's also uh, uh, highly uh, dynamic in terms of, uh, of sediment and water movement through it. And so uh, trying, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a wonder why anybody bothered with it, except for the fact that it's, uh, it's a very important trading route. And so uh, it seems that uh, everything was done with that in mind in terms of holding back the sediment, holding back the water, trying, mm -hmm. because uh, we have evidence, not just in Wadi Haramiya, but in all uh, kinds of other places around Petra, where people were saying, okay, we have this agricultural land, uh, we have this, um, uh, this uh, setup in terms of roads, in terms of everything, and uh, it's being washed away. So, uh, because of again the, this changing base level that we have, and so uh, so yeah, tectonism and seismicity. Seismicity, of course, is a problem for individual structures for a short period of time. But the long term impact of tectonism was more of a uh, of a thing that they were dealing with uh, uh, throughout this process of managing the site. Okay, thank you. Well, let's follow up together. Okay, yeah, I look forward uh, to an email from you. Sure. Okay, great. Very good initiative. And uh, now a question from, uh, from the audience. If you have any questions, ask questions through Zoom group chat, or just, uh, you just, uh, you know, open your microphone and ask questions, whatever you have. Uh, I see Mr. Bowen. Bowen, uh, are you there? You can, yes. I can, you can ask your students uh, to ask questions, and on behalf of the students, you can ask. 
Please ask question clearly. I think I, 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 I think have a question. Hello. Oh, yes, this is our professor. Okay, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for the very wonderful lecture. I'm IDRMA. I'm an associate professor from IDRMA. And uh, my question is uh, that the max the uh, farm the, 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 uh, the, the from the material we know that the, the terrace the device is increasing the seepage flow and is reducing water flow uh, uh, sounds like sounds like the proposed uh, sponge city uh, if this device can be applied to the disaster prevention uh, mitigation in mountain basins, uh, maybe it is of great uh, application value. At the same time, I want to ask, uh, uh, I don't know how, uh, how um, uh, I, I just want to ask the, the city's flood control standard in the research uh, area and uh, Regarding the application of the terrace in mountain areas, will the content of the sediment uh, will block the device? Uh, and the, the, the standard, is there any standard for the content of a sediment for a device? Uh, the, the, the terrace uh, in, in, in the area, in area uh, is 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 similar to the uh, step and the name the step deep pro used in the mud rock flow prevention device in China, uh, the mountain river of southwest China. Uh, but the step the deep pro is uh, just uh, checked stuck stuck with stones with different size in the river ditch or maybe in the river. Uh, if the the device uh, for a terrace proposed uh, is used for disaster prevention, maybe in China. Yeah. Mm, how? Uh, I, I just want to know is there any problem for a cost? The cost for economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, e economic cost problem is there uh, be because the use is very, very many, very, very much area need so, such kind of things. Thank you. So I think you're asking about, uh, I, I'm not sure I understood your question because the quality of the sound wasn't, uh, wasn't consistent. Uh, but I think you're asking about uh, uh, the, the devices that we were using to, to measure the runoff, I think. The, the runoff measurement devices you're asking me about or the terraces themselves? I'm not sure, but uh, but but the issue of calibration of the devices, I think I I think that's the question. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, I mean the the calibration is basically uh, based on the size and the shape and the slope of the channel that we were using, and uh, so obviously there's standard techniques for uh, for calibration. And uh, yeah, of course, the movement of sediments through it will change that calibration. And so uh, the, the idea is that, uh, yes, it's, it's not perfect, but it's much better than, uh, than ha not having any data at all. So that's how, how, we, how I see it. Um, Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I have a number of uh, chats here. So should I just read them or? Uh... Yeah. Uh, 
if uh, they can make a you know a short comment, Mister um, Majadul Rahman, uh -huh. he, you know, he, can you say your question? Yeah, he's asking about the stability of the terraces and the risk of uh, it. Yeah. Katrina, who's uh, who's our expert on terraces. Ah, uh, okay. Saying, so she uh, she was uh, already yeah. answered the question. Sorry. Okay. Uh, other question, like uh, Mr. Tedra. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Actually, my question is more of related to policy issue. Uh, just wondering, like, uh, how can we integrate this? Uh, cultural heritage protection and water resource and basin development interests in a large scale where there is a, uh, many countries in a transboundary uh, like the Nile. So uh, how can we integrate uh, this uh, issue in, in, in such cases? Because there is a large uh, conflict in these countries because of uh, lack of agreement. So that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, I'd say that uh, the scale issue is is important here. Uh, obviously, we're talking about a very small uh, drainage basin with an, uh, uh, with a small amount of water, and it's not obvious that this system can be scaled up to something like a major river, uh, simply because the amount of water that you need to control is much too too large. Uh, for anything that would make a difference in terms of uh, starting a war between uh, countries or anything like that. Uh, maybe herders would fight over it, but not uh, countries. Um, but, uh, but generally speaking, uh, it is a, I would see it more as, a, uh, as an opportunity for, for collaboration because uh, obviously uh, flooding and optimal use of water is of everybody's benefit. The way uh, these transboundary waters uh, are viewed now is more as a zero-sum game. So you're looking at uh, uh, you're looking at uh, people saying, "Okay, we have a specific amount of water. What's your share, and what's my share?" And uh, we we have a discussion or a fight over that. And uh, one of the underlying messages here is that not all of this water actually uh, is being accounted for because we have a lot of water that's uh, kind of going, uh, uh, it's being wasted during flooding events and, uh, and so forth. So actually, um, both at a national level and perhaps at a more a larger level, if, if it can be scaled up, you could be talking about actually increasing the amounts of water that are available, uh, which should lower tensions, I would hope. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Mr. Raman, do you have any additional question? If not, I have one question. May I? Okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this is great. Uh, you know, this is real integrated water resources management 2000 years ago. And I was uh, very much impressed and surprised how, mu how much detailed, you know, the, they have uh, designed this system. So who did that? Is that the leader who did that? Is that the community? Is that uh, a group of the engineers or the, uh, you know, small leaders or the priests or religious people who did that? And then uh, is there any study on that? Well, <laughs> uh, I let my colleague, uh, Katrina, answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the, uh, for the question. Uh, actually, it is a very complicated issue when you talk about building of terraces. Uh, when we, in our study uh, covered the basin of uh, Petra, and we have found out that some of the designs, they are used in the same way in the same area of the catchment area, despite the variation in material or in methods, which in my opinion, it goes into the, uh, that there had been 
a group of people who are being trained, who knew how to build terraces and how to intervene with these terraces in various locations. Now, if, when you're talking about uh, small landowners, when they wanted to terrace their land for agriculture, we have evidence that it was actually done by the family using, for example, the stones and there had been a division of work. So you will have the owner uh, where you, he could do the, with in help with the different you know, workers to build up the terraces walls. And you'll have a minor you know, group of the community, for example, women or small children who could provide the small stones. But still you needed to have at least one person or two who are masons who will know how to cut the stones because in building a terrace, the design of the wall, you needed to have specific wall, you know, stones. You need to have also wedge stones that will be in, wedged into the wall to make you know, sure of its stability and its form. So uh, in these parts, I think it was both from the government and also from the local community. Some inscriptions that we found in various locations actually mention of building a, a terrace or a, a dam with a set of terraces or walls. And these were dedicated to Dabitian gods. For example, we have, you know, in an area in Wadi Araba, we have in some areas in Veda, inscriptions that dedicate the, the, this, you know, uh, structure to Arita, you know, done in the time of the Aritas to Dushara. And this is, you know, for to invoke the protection of the God and also as a part of, you know, giving and forgiving and, you know, uh, working on it. In addition, there was an, an aspect of maintenance where these terraces need to be maintained. And this was probably done if it's owned by the uh, landowner, he will do it in each, you know, some be in the summer before the winter time. And if it was, for example, a part of a road, I haven't, uh, we have, you know, indirect uh, indications that it could have been the army who was actually collecting taxes for the road. They also maintained part of the terraces that protected the roads. So it's a combined system between local communities and the government, you know, forces that work together in order to make the whole system work. Thank you very much. It is very interesting. So I have actually a memo that doesn't questions, but I cannot uh, ask it maybe <laughs> later uh, since the time has come. Uh, but it was uh, extremely interesting uh, one and a half, one and a half. And then uh, also, oh, we, want, we do not want to conclude uh, this, it is my uh, duty to enter into the closing session. So before my uh, closing words, I'd like, you know, Lina-san, are you still here? Uh, Ambassador? Yes, I'm here. Yes, uh, which may I ask you, uh, you know, concluding remarks? Um, thank you, Professor Hiroki. Uh, this has been extremely enlightening and uh, uh, inspiring as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Abu Jaber. It's uh, wonderful to see how um, um, you have put um, um, again, you know, the research findings to be put to be applied into uh, uh, practical and into uh, uh, important solutions for uh, for for today's problems. Uh, flooding, flash flooding is a problem that we continuously hear about in, in Petra. And um, uh, it's incredible to see that the Nabataeans were able to control it and even not only control it, also make use of the of the uh, water, not uh, having it uh, wasted uh, in, in, in reserving it and in, in making use of it for, for, uh, for uh, whether it is drinking water uh, or uh, even agriculture. So uh, um, this to me really, um, to see that there is something happening and there is uh, some collaboration in terms of uh, rebuilding some of the terraces uh, is um, is wonderful and um, actually I had a question but I'm not going I will ask it but I'm not going to wait for an answer because I know the time is, is up but it would be extremely interesting to learn if there has been a simulation about uh, rebuilding all of the terraces that we know of and what the impact of that means, whether it is on agriculture or in uh, saving uh, uh, water. Um, but again, I'm not waiting for an answer, but this is something that came to mind as, as you were talking. Thank you, Professor uh, Abu Jaber. Thank you, Professor Hiroki. 
thank you, uh, Dean uh, Gretchen, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Hamarne. It's so wonderful to see you uh, and to hear you. Um, uh, thank you to Dr. Farajat, the Chief Commissioner of, uh, PD, of Petra PDTRA. Um, it's so great to see everybody, and um, uh, I hope we can do this again. Um, I hope we can do it in Petra in person, but if not, I hope we can have similar webinars in the future. GRIPS, uh, I can't thank enough. We're so proud of this uh, uh, association, and we really look forward to doing more things uh, with you uh, in, in this field and in other fields as well. Thank you so much. Domo, arigato gozaimashita, and you have been great. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Linana. My real last words. And then uh, I know, I think everybody agrees that this uh, webinar was uh, very much of a success. Uh, thanks to wonderful presentation by Professor Nija Abjabar, but also with the, uh, with the cooperation by the Embassy of Jordan in, here in Tokyo. And I'm also grateful to all the participants, particularly uh, those from China, and uh, Professor Gretchen Kalondi, and the international students and faculty members of GRIPS and other university and institutions. This is the uh, just a conclusion of one and a half, but at the same time, this is the beginning of the real cooperation among all the international people. The, uh, uh, the Professor Najar's presentation shed a scientific light on the importance and significance of investigating the relations between water and culture. And uh, we can learn from these examples to benefit our next generations in terms of water management, in terms of uh, culture preservation, and in terms of the heritage enhancement. So, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, shortly discussed about future collaboration. And, and uh, I'm sure that uh, we are all motivated to continue it. With our determination to continue our collaboration through webinars, through the actual works, I'd like to conclude session by thanking all for participating in this session until the last moment. Professor, Thank you very much. Can I say one thing, please? Yes, please. Uh, I on, on one of the screens, I noticed that the entire Department of Antiquities in Jordan, including the director of the Department of Antiquities, are also listening to us. So uh, I just wanted to say uh, uh, hello to them and to thank them very much for being present and also to share with everyone that uh, the entire Department of Antiquities in Jordan is watching. And if they say something, it says how important this, uh, um, this uh, field for us and how important this subject is for us um, on all levels, whether it's academic or even uh, uh, government side. So um, I, I just wanted to say hello to them and to thank them for being with us today. Thank you very much for from me to all the Jordanian stakeholders and officials and people who spent uh, their precious time to attend this important symposium. Thank you very much. The session is concluded. See Thank you, you very much. Greetings and see you soon.